Welcome everyone to panel number four, which is looking at the theme of gender with face coverings um, and with face masks and head coverings. Um, so my name is Dr. Elizabeth Keeley Morris. I'm a senior lecturer here at the Manchester Fashion Institute in fashion communication. Um, so very, very pleased to welcome um, panels with Dr. Alison Matthews David, Miriam Courtier, uh, Andrew Groves, and uh, Professor Andrew Groves, and Dr. Danielle Sprechter. Um, unfortunately, I just have to let everyone know that uh, Daniel Beard is unwell and unable to present. So we can expand the, um, the conversation, which will be quite nice. Um, as well as um, have a little bit of longer of a break between now and the evening um, events. So um, Dr. Allison Matthews David and Miriam Courtier will be speaking about toxic masculinities, men, masks, and criminality, past and present. Um, Dr. Allison Matthews David is an associate professor at the School of Fashion, Ryerson University. She has a PhD from Stanford and has published 19th century and early 20th century dress and material culture and launched the open access journal Fashion Studies with Dr. Ben Barry in 2018. Um, Miriam Courtier is a, a PhD candidate in the Joint Communication and Culture Program at Ryerson in York Universities in Toronto and holds an MA in fashion from Ryerson. Um, and her research interests are fashion history, gender material, and visual culture with specific focus on everyday fashion and historical dress and collections. Um, so want to welcome you both. Thank you very much for presenting and I'll hand it over to you now. That's okay. Wonderful. Okay, I think Miriam will be sharing the PowerPoint, but just wanted to say so far, this has been wonderful. It's really exciting to be here from Toronto and to discuss masks. So. Um, so thank you for this conference and for all the so far. Um, all right, I'll just start and hopefully we can get this um, full screen as well. Or no, actually, I guess it's all right. Is it all right? I think it's all right. Okay. Um, a person can be toxic either liter literally or figuratively or both. While describing a person as toxic originally meant that they were either poisonous or exhibited signs of infection, now we use it in an emotional sense as well, to speak of someone who is malicious or harmful to others, as in X is toxic. Uh, next slide, please. Goodness. Unfortunately, just last week in the US Capitol, we witnessed displays of overwhelmingly, but not exclusively masculine toxicity and mask flouting white supremacist behavior combined with physical violence exemplified by the man on the left and I can't help but see his open mouth and think of super spreading. But of course, there have also been acts of great heroism and bravery from masked actors like Officer Eugene Goodman on the right, wearing a white and thus typically hygienically colored mask. While the racialized and gender dynamics of toxicity, threat, and danger are complicated historically and today, men are statistically overrepresented in almost all types of criminalized behavior, from street crimes and sexual violence to white collar crime. And next slide, please. In the field, and so for example, just to give you a you know infographic, um, this is just EU data from 2015 of violent sexual crimes, and you can see that overwhelmingly um, the victims of this crime were female, and the 99% of the perpetrators who were imprisoned were male. In the field of cultural criminology, scholars like James Messerschmidt in his seminal 1993 text, text Masculinities and Crime have proposed that crime is a form of quote unquote, doing masculinity. Visually performing crime is a show and for end quote, for men, crime serves, serves as a resource for doing gender, end quote. That's Messerschmidt. In this period of COVID-19 and political unrest, we do well to examine how discourses around crime, threat, health, and masculinity are intertwined. Uh, next slide, please. The history of masks and facial coverings and criminalized behavior is a long and perhaps suitably convoluted one. This paper hopes to unravel, so to speak, some of those historical ties and bring that knowledge to the present context. 
Um, this research is part of a larger book and exhibition project on the fabric of crime that looks at clothing and accessories functioning as weapons in protection, forensic evidence and disguise. And this is the website, the project website we have. So if you want to consult it, um, there are resources and things there. The research is still very much in progress and this is necessarily an overview, but Miriam and I hope to share our thoughts on masking and crime from the late 17th century to the present and to examine a range of sources through a gendered lens. Next slide, please. Our sources for this paper are mostly American and British and include the Old Bailey trial transcripts from London's Old Bailey or Central Criminal Court. This re um, these word for word transcripts of cases between 1674 and 1913 are freely available online and searchable and a valuable source for fashion research. And you can see on the left, I'm just, I've included some of the descriptions of materials and um, kind of designs, different things that masks were made of in some of the trials um, in the period that we're discussing. They contain at least 151 criminal trials involving facial masking. And of those cases, only 2% of the sample or three cases in total involved masked women and description, um, and masked women. So, um, you know, very small percentage. Uh, next slide, please. Christoph Heil argues in his article, when they are veiled on purpose to be seen, British women of the upper classes did wear full fashionable, full, wear fashionable full, full face black velvet masks as winter shields for their skin and to maintain some semblance of privacy in spaces like parks and theaters. Women were more, however, more associated, however, with the practice of veiling. So next slide. Um, and the British, uh, sorry, and the Old Bailey contains references of veiled women in the 19th century committing crimes like deception and forgery of checks, as opposed to violent street crimes. That said, media reports suggest that women and cross-dressing men used the almost opaque full veiling offered by Victorian widow's weeds to commit violent assaults and crimes. Next slide, please. This research made me curious about the material culture of masking and criminality. I had to ask what physically makes a good mask to be used with criminal intent. As Igor Kopitov would ask, what is an ideal career for a criminal mask? Well, uh, lots of answers to that. Um, it's ideally dark or black in color, made of silk or crepe, which is often a silk or silken worsted, so woolen fabric. Um, and it often, they often seem to be improvised or fashioned from scraps or whatever dark fabric was available. As Lou Taylor's comprehensive and classic work on morning dress demonstrates, both men and women traditionally wore black, dark, or drab fabrics for full mourning in Europe and North America. So next slide, please. And so here's an example of female and male mourning dress. You can see quite a bit more um, obscuring for women than for men who often just put crepe to kind of dull down their silk top hats, for example. On the right, you can see a mourning band on the hat. But both genders participated in it. Um, so uh, what was the ideal material for masking the face for criminal purposes? Next slide. Here's a list. Ideally, your criminal mask would be unnoticeable cloth, so not distinctively colored or patterned. There would be some kind of compromise between opacity and transparency so that the perpetrator could see others but not be clearly seen. Some breathability is good. A looser weave or knitted fabrics with some stretch would be perfect. Uh, you didn't want it to reflect light. We can talk about that, how that <laughs> plays out in crime, crimes, many of which were committed at nighttime, but you didn't want a lustrous shine, sheen, or finish. Um, and readily available and cheap were, were also good things. And then, so this made, next slide please, this made crepe, um, spelled with an A, <laughs> the perfect uh, fabric. So dull black crepe fabrics were deliberately woven with a matte finish required by mourning custom. They're mentioned by name in almost 40% of Old Bailey trials involving masks. And sometimes there is a distinction made between a mask and a crepe. Um, we, again, we can talk about that more, but they were considered bad luck, um, this crepe, and disposed of after the mourning period. Um, and it was already a fearsome fabric connoting emotional trauma, so symbolized and embodied death and grief. Um, and I, again, didn't have time to talk about it too much, but it could, because of its kind of 
uh, lightness and flimsiness sometimes. It could also cause criminal wardrobe malfunctions, if you like. So there were many cases, especially of highway robbery, where the wind blew the crepe up or it fell out of a hat. So um, in fact, it did not serve as a mask um, in the way that it was intended. Okay, next slide, please. The types of mask crime committed are, of course, historically contingent. In terms of the Old Bailey records, late 17th and 18th century mass crimes are overwhelmingly highway robberies. Um, so yeah, I, I found the one picture from the period that I could find of the highwayman, and of course he's not wearing a mask, but many of them did, um, and many of them wore crepes. Um, and then with uh, safer roads, policing, and urbanization, uh, next slide please, we tend to see more cases of things like thefts, housebreaking, and burglaries. So I'm showing you a cat burglar here, finding a cat, but, and wearing his, his mask, his trademark mask. Um, cat burglars were called that because they were silent. Um, and then by the late 19th century, we start to see armed bank robberies. So the holdup of myth and legend start to become more common. And that's when we also start to see knit fabrics like stockings uh, and eventually the balaclava. Okay. so. Next slide, please. In terms of actual surviving masks used in crimes, the early, earliest physical ones I found and seen in person are the stocking masks worn in 1905 by the Stratton brothers in South London. The case was memorable because it was the first in the UK to have a jury ever to convict based on fingerprint evidence. But the press of the day also called them the mask murders. The crude and improvised mask masks hacked from old black stockings were also star evidence. They are held in the famous Scotland Yard Crime Museum um, and if you know of any other earlier masks please let me know um, but I've had to usually rely on written and visual accounts for periods before before this. Another next slide please. Another two more surviving masks are from a major bank holdup near Montreal Canada in 1924 and come from um, the Wil Wilfred de Home Laboratory. De Holm was a forensic expert who founded the first crime lab in North America in Montreal in 1914, so before, say, New York. One was made from a woman's black stocking on the left, and the other was um, black cloth and described as a hood or cagoule. And again, to talk about performativity, the second one, as you can see from this newspaper report, was actually worn during the trial by the Crown Prosecutor, and then um, other mask was, it was framed and presented to the jury during the trial, and this is not at all unusual. Okay, next. Uh, uh, actually, I think we can keep that. Uh, you know, next one, thank you. Okay, by the early 20th century, as germ theory was becoming widely understood and accepted, and new masks were being in invented to protect against contagious disease, medical and hygienic masks, um, uh, sorry, wait, actually, can we go back just really quickly? Sorry. I also just wanted to say that um, that kind of masks were important actors within the criminal justice system, and many were hastily donned and then equally quickly discarded and even thrown over hedges at crime scenes. These particular mask on the right was thrown into the getaway car, um, for example. They were stuffed into pockets or under coats or concealed in trunks, and police searched suspects' persons in their living quarters, and if they found a physical mask, it was used as direct proof that a crime was premeditated and deliberate. Few items were as incriminate, were more incriminating as evidence. Um, and just to give you some stats, the, in 48 of the Old Bailey cases that I looked at, the physical masks themselves were discovered by police or witnesses. And in 14 of them, they were produced in court um, and presented to the jury as evidence. So um, this often, the mask was often a really key piece of evidence. Okay, sorry, back to medical masks. <laughs> um, but you see, um, medical masks are, very different, radically different from criminal masks. Um, although they did, as Miriam will discuss, they sometimes provided a cover for criminal activity. The hygienic civilian mask is usually white or light colored and visually signals the wearer's virtue and protection of themselves and of others, as we've been discussing. Medical masks are unstained and made of washable fabrics, whether cotton or gauze, like that used for healing textiles, like bandages and sterile pads or now for more technologically advanced but problematic, as we've seen, non-woven fabrics. Um, next slide. And um, to kind of switch over to Miriam's section, I thought we would <laughs> show our flu veil again um, and talk about it in light of sort of criminality. And then I also just wanted to share 
um, I'm using the Sydney specials as they're called, the New South Wales um, Police Forensic Archive mugshots, partly because they're so unusual and they talk about dress a lot, but this is a picture of Alice Mason, a photograph of her from a mugshot, a detail from 1924, and she was arrested in a fraud case for a dress shop, actually. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's very interesting how uh, usually facial kind of visibility is important, but here she's still photographed um, you wearing a veil as she would be on the streets, so outdoors. Okay, Miriam, over to you. Thank you. Um, so now that we've discussed historical examples of criminal masks, their uses and materials, we're going to shift to the topic of pandemic masks and how narratives of personal safety, responsibility, and criminality intersect around this accessory. The influenza pandemic of 1918 was the first time the mask was worn on a large public scale and had a positive and protective function. Um, as we saw in the earlier presentation this morning, um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, as with the COVID-19 pandemic, various cities in the United States instituted, instituted mask wearing mandates to curb the spread of the virus. Refusal to wear so-called flu masks could lead to fines or arrests. But even as doctors and other authority figures encouraged everyone to wear masks, the accessory could not escape its suspicious or criminal connotations in the popular press and imagination. At the time, various newspaper commentators and cartoonists noted that it was difficult to recognize people in public, even close friends and family members, when they were wearing masks. The first two photos here are from the Omaha Daily Bee from December 15, 1918. They show a group of Red Cross volunteers who went from house to house as part of a Christmas time membership drive. The article jokingly referred to the women as white mask brigade and as feminine banditti. It described their fundraising efforts both as a kidnapping and as a holdup, which in either case would cost the victim $1. The author noted, quote, you can't even tell if it's your wife or your best girl behind the mask, unquote. Yet it reassured readers that the mask wasn't part of the holdup disguise at all, as it was just a flu mask. Even the most respectable, responsible actors in the pandemic were subjected to this kind of commentary. The third photo shows the governor and chairman of the State Tax Commission of Arizona, who are introduced as, quote, not banditti, but rather extremely law-abiding citizens in their flu masks. Oh, sorry. In other articles, the masks were discussed as fundamentally deceptive accessories worn either to commit crimes or as a way for some women to hide their less attractive features. It was argued in the Seattle Star, for example, that some women were, quote, taking full benefit of this temporary mask delusion, unquote. In the same article, a known old time holdup man was said to have walked into the sheriff's office wearing a white silk handkerchief on his face stating that, quote, the only difference between this mask and the one I used to wear is that this is white and mine was red, unquote. As Allison mentioned earlier, masks were made of, or masks made of white fabric signaled health and safety, while darker face coverings, including red ones, were associated with criminal activity. The article also discussed the authorities' fear that flu masks would make holdups easier and more frequent. In these quotes here, we see the idea that the mask was both a symbol of criminality and a fundamental tool to fight invisible illness. The second passage especially suggests that regular people were acting as symbolic highwaymen against the flu. The mask then was the site of tension and anxiety. It could represent both criminal activity and an act of responsible citizenship. Newspapers also reported on actual crimes that were committed by flu masked perpetrators. In Los Angeles in October 1918, two fashionably dressed women wearing masks showed up to a woman's home, were invited inside, produced a gun, and stole $130 from the victim. Masks were slowly eroding trust in strangers. Other widely reported holdups and robberies, some of them fatal, involved sus suspects wearing flu masks. All of these crimes could have easily happened before the pandemic, but flu masks added a layer of uncertainty and threat due to their ubiquity. The mask could be worn by criminals, but it could also be used to deceive them. For example, it could serve as a disguise for undercover detective work. This quote from Joe Turney from the book Fashion Crimes effectively summarizes why the mask in a variety of settings and even when worn lawfully or responsibly has the potential to make people uncomfortable or suspicious. I think it easily applies to many of the case studies that we're looking at today, both um, historical and present. As with the COVID-19 pandemic, men in 1918 were less likely than women to wear masks. Some men considered the accessory to be too feminine or they refused masks because they thought themselves immune to the flu. 
men featured prominently in newspaper reports about mask-related arrests or fines. When the appeals of medical professionals failed, policemen were invoked as models of mask compliance. One article celebrated the quote-unquote artistry shown by policemen in the wearing of their masks. They were described as handymen who had managed to improve the look of the standard medical mask. One desk sergeant fashioned his mask with copper wires that hooked over the ears. The apron style mask was suspended on the bridge of the nose and was easy to put on and remove. It was apparently emulated by several officers at the station. Another man improved on this idea and fashioned his mask like a pair of glasses. So masks here were framed as a technology or hardware that could always be upgraded rather than a fashion, which obviously had more feminine connotations. Outside the police station, one man was said to wear his mask, quote, under the hat and when he entered an elevator, switch the mask to position, thereby complying with the law on the street and in the elevator, unquote. So interestingly, some highway robbers from the Old Bailey trials wore their crepes in a similar way, pinned under their hats, um, and they were able to pull them on and off when necessary. Men needed to be convinced that adding a mask to their ensemble was no more complicated than any other accessory. A doctor and medical lecturer in Iowa declared that it was, quote, no bother to wear a flu mask. I put mine on in the same matter of fact way that I put on my collar, unquote. This was a way to show that the mask could be a normal, rational part of the male uniform. While masks were sometimes presented as criminal accessories, they were now also part of an official uniform of social responsibility. Yet they still had to be reconciled with the male quasi uniform, to use Jennifer Craig's term of the period. In late spring and summer 2020, various news articles and academic studies pointed out that during the COVID pandemic, men still refused to wear masks at a higher rate than women. Some key findings from these studies are that men are less likely to wear masks in the US or to wear them correctly in Japan, for example. One often cited study by Valerio Capraro and Hélène Barcelo found that men see masks as, quote, shameful, not cool, a sign of weakness and a stigma, and that men more than women believe that they will be relatively unaffected by the disease, unquote. Another study found that men do not like masks primarily because they infringe on their freedom. So I think it's important to look at specific ways this mask reluctance um, has been expressed. While masks are a regular part of some professional uniforms, such as doctors, nurses, even criminals, and many essential workers today, they are seen by some as a superfluous accessory that does not fit within the typical and more sartorially conservative male uniform. For instance, some men prefer to wear bandanas or neck warmers or gaiters um, instead of masks, which are overall less protective and therefore more dangerous, but they speak to specific masculine tropes and acceptable uniforms. Bandanas, unlike medical masks, are not specifically designed to protect against illness. They serve other purposes, symbolically related to physical labor, the figure of the cowboy, or activities such as riding a motorcycle or sports. And paradoxically, um, were also historically associated with outlaws when worn on the face. So some of the most toxic acts of mask refusal have been performed by politicians like Donald Trump, who for months refused to wear a mask to protect against COVID-19, mocked his male opponents for wearing masks and engaged in dangerous rhetoric that associated masks with weakness, leading to disastrous public health consequences. The first time Trump wore a mask in public in July 2020, he compared himself to the Lone Ranger, thereby making a symbolic reference to a hypermasculine masked Avenger figure that, in the televised version of the story, fought crime and injustice and restored order in a mythical, largely unpopulated American West one in which Native American presence and social organization were effectively erased. So a character like the Lone Ranger makes the mask acceptable. He symbolizes ideals of male power, um, control, and hegemonic masculinity, centering them around a specific uniform that enables the wearer to enact what sociologists Douglas Schrock and Michael Schwab describe as manhood acts that elicit deference from others. With the Lone Ranger, Trump attempted to reframe the mask as an accessory that expresses white, authoritarian, masculine power, rather than being a primarily protective device. The Lone Ranger's mask, of course, does not cover his mouth and provides no protection at all against harmful viruses. Even today, the mask can't escape its association with criminality. In the last few months, there have been reports of crimes being committed by people wearing coronavirus masks, including a series of robberies in the Chicago area. As commentators have pointed out, in the past, masks would have provoked suspicion when worn by a suspect or even if simply found in their possession, just as the standalone piece of crepe um, was suspicious in the Old Bailey literature or the mask if found 
anywhere related to the suspect would also have been um, suspicious. Protective medical masks also make surveillance and by extension the work of law enforcement more difficult. So from the early days of scientific policing, including in the work of Alphonse Bertillon in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, precise data and the legibility of the face have been fundamental to policing and surveillance activities. Just last week, a Japanese company called NEC announced the launch of a facial recognition technology, such as the kind that is used by police departments and airlines that works with people wearing masks um, with an accuracy rate of more than 99.9%. Hi, two minutes left. Thank you. Okay. The mask today is an important accessory, one that is crucial to the maintenance of public health but it is still seen as something that could be used to conceal, deceive, and evade. In the historical crime cases discussed today and in different pandemic settings, the mask has symbolized risk and threat in ways both material and immaterial. The mask paradoxically makes the illness more visible, even though it protects the wearer and others. By not wearing a mask, many men symbolically refuse to engage with the idea of danger itself, even though statistically they are more vulnerable to COVID and more likely to die of it than women. In many places, not wearing a mask will not lead to an arrest or a fine. It allows for a quiet level of toxicity that is legally permitted, but nonetheless dangerous. As masks continue to be a part of our lives for the foreseeable future, it will be interesting to see how the gender debates and practices around them continue to develop. And here are a few examples. I did a search on Etsy yesterday for manly masks, and you see sort of patterns like barnwood and camo and metal, um, a cowboy. So it's interesting to see how um, these devices or these accessories are being marketed to men um, several months into the pandemic. Okay. Thank you. Oh, interesting. Yes, the patterns are great there. Um, okay, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, and we're going to move on to the final uh, paper now. So if everyone just keeps a uh, note of questions you might have for Alison and Miriam. Oops, sorry. That would be great. Um, okay, so we're now going to hear from Professor Andrew Groves and Dr. Danielle Sprechter from the University of Westminster. And uh, Professor um, Adam Groves is the director of the Westminster Menswear Archive, which he founded in 2016. It's the world's only publicly accessible menswear archive. It's used by industry, researchers, and students, and it contains over 2,000 examples of some of the most important menswear garments covering the last 120 years. Dr. Danielle Sprechter is the curator of the Westminster Menswear Archive and co-curated the exhibition Invisible Men. She's a historian whose research focuses on the history of British menswear and men's fashion, exploring the industry from design to production and final consumption. As a curator, she's worked with several historical dress collections across the UK. So very warm welcome to um, Andrew and Danielle, and it's over to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um... So I'm very pleased to be here and share our work, um, I guess, that we've been doing over the last year concerning um, the pandemic. So I think Danielle's going to start with an introduction and an overview of the, the menswear archive. Hi, uh, yes, as Andrew said, um, thank you very much for um, allowing us to share our research. So um, as Elizabeth mentioned, um, the collection dates back to 2016 um, when we had about 50 garments. Um, and we were funded by an internal grant um, for three years to rapidly expand the archive. So we now have around 2,000 pieces of menswear and accessories. Um, it's a uh, teaching collection primarily used by the University of Westminster students, but we are also um, closely engaged with designers from the fashion industry and open to external students and researchers. So um, in July 2020, we were given a small grant from the University of Westminster Research Office as part of a one-off funding call um, through the university for projects seeking to address issues 
arising from the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And our project um, is a year long project um, and it aims to document the rapidly evolving reaction to the pandemic over one year by the British menswear industry. Um, the focus for this is through the collection of examples of PPE and masks within the historical context of British menswear production during other periods of crisis, for example, the First and Second World Wars. Um, so through this research project, we're interested in looking at um, the gendering of masks, how they've evolved over this um, period of a year, and how they adopt menswear tropes around masculinities. Um, and I'll pass over to Andrew to look at some context of um, masks within um, men's fashion. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so what follows um, is examples of uh, garments with masks or hoods from the Westminster Menswear Archive. Um, so predominantly all of these were already part of the archive collection. Um, and I think what's worth pointing out that it's a teaching collection and the garments have been selected as representative to, um, rather than just for their historical importance, garments within the collection are selected as outstanding examples of menswear due to their design, make or construction regardless of whether they were produced uh, for military utilitarian or, or a designer outcome. So as much as possible, we're trying to avoid a high hierarchy of, of purpose of the, the objects that we've been collecting. Um, and within that, masks have become a, a significant menswear statement since the 1990s. And this trend was a mixture of, of an increasing influence of military uniforms as record points as for design but also growing uneasiness as we reach the end of the 20th century. Um, and so this example you can see here is by the next generation, um, who are two designers, Joe Hunter and Adam Thorpe. Um, and their designs reference ongoing unease with the rise of CCTV um, during the 1990s and also the introduction of the Criminal Justice Act. And so they actually formed their design company as a protest. It wasn't actually uh, actually for manufacturing garments that was just a side aspect of their protest and they had a slogan which was called you put up a camera we put up a collar so they were definitely thinking of their de designs as, as being about protest um, rather than in fashion statements but what was interesting their language uh, borrows all from military garments at the time so much so that they actually ended up selling some of the garments to members of the British police because it's crossed those boundaries between whether it's a design object or is it actually a useful object. Um, and then after that, from 1997, we've got a CP company, Urban Protection Metropolis jacket with an attachable mask. So uh, Italian menswear brand CP company developed the Urban Protection range between 1997 and 2000. And pictured here is the Metropolis jacket designed by Morona Ferrari the range included some of the most technical and radical innovative menswear garments, um, which hit, featured hidden technology um, to address the threats and dangers faced by modern man. And so there was a range of garments, approximately 40 over four years, and they featured integral gas detectors, microcomputers, lights, torches, inflatable cushions. One even came with a scooter that fitted into a backpack. Um, and another was a cape that transformed into a hammock. So it was borrowing all that language of industrial, technical, military um, menswear, but putting it into a, in a designer garment. Um, and I, somewhat ironically, although these garments were designed to address the ills, I guess, of modern society, these garments actually became quite sought after by British football hooligans in the late 1990s and the 2000s. Here is uh, another urban, uh, another Vex Generation jacket from 2000. Um, and this version is four years on from the early example. And you can see how the mask has become far more functional and useful and less about a conceptual approach to use. Uh, this jacket came with a respiro mask was worn by cycle couriers. So it's now become a more normal, functional garment that you might easily wear, understand it's become part of everyday life. Also within the archive collection, we've got examples of military uh, uniforms. And here, 
is um, a military snow camouflage ghillie suit. Um, and the use of military or of industrial garments as source research material became an ever more present approach to menswear design in the 1990s, which led to designers using numerous garments that have specific functions to repurpose them as fashion outcomes. And so this British camo suit, which is uh, a modern version of an older design, bears a striking similarity to this, which is a beekeeper jacket, which is also by CP Company and was designed by Marino and Ferrari. Perhaps the most uncompromising uncompr mask garment that was available at retail, it's a hybrid of a beekeeper's outfit with a military parka. It also highlights a high point of design processes as Marino had spoken of being able to spend over a year to perfect the design away from commercial pressures and production demands. Um, and the hood on this is actually completely removable. So uh, around the neck, it can be unzipped and it can be worn without the hood, with the hood hanging down. So it's, it's, it's multi-purpose. You can you know, adapt this as you want to wear it. This example is of an existing military garment within the archive. It's a 1975 Swiss Alpenflage camouflage M70 jacket. And it features a gauze-like net face covering with camouflage. So you can see that on the face there. Um, and it's a highly referenced jacket within both menswear during this period and for the next 20 years. And it's actually become the template for a number of jackets produced a number of fashion brands. So this jacket, although it was originally designed for military use, most designer brands have done a version of this jacket over the last 20 years. And this example is by a British menswear company that started at the late uh, 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, One True Saxon. Um, and it's an exact replica of the jacket you've just seen, but it's been changed by making it in a sand color rather than camouflage. And the letters OST, standing for one true section and use to create a visual representation of the face um, covering. And as we move more up to date in 2014, Supreme, as well as their normal skatewear, sweatshirts and t-shirts, Supreme are known for their appropriations of various objects, which then are branded with the Supreme logo. And these have included pinball machines, crowbars, even Oreo cookies were branded with the Supreme logo. And in this case, a cycle courier's mask and by this time it's become a, I would say a very normalized object that is designer but also functional wearable and it doesn't seem that odd. And then here these masks are by Off-White designed by Virgil Abloh. Though they look like a designer response to COVID-19, these masks actually date back to May 2017. And each collection that's been produced since then by Off-White has included variations of these masks up until the present day. So they're still being produced. And, and with anything that's produced by Off-White, these are now highly collectible. So I checked earlier today, you can buy these, these, these from May 2017 on StockX for 128 pounds at the moment. So it's probably an interesting fact, I guess, that here's a mask that's, that you can still buy um, that was designed for a fashion purpose rather than a COVID pur purpose. And then this takes us up to August 2018. And this uh, was given away um, as an invitation to a cold world spring summer 19 runway show. Uh, and these glasses, masks and protective eyewear are by British designer Samuel Ross. All of the items you can see here are ready-made, brought from a safety retailer and they have had a signature, a Cold War branding applied to them. The items after they were sent as an as a invitation to the show then became a part of a, a, a small capsule collection and you could buy this online. And the prices range from 20 pounds for the earplugs, which you can't see, to 50 pounds for the glasses. Uh, and for us, I suppose what's interesting here is the appropriation of industrial garments or objects and merely through the, the the branding being applied to them they become a designer artifact and now danielle is going to talk about some of the masks we've acquired since covid19 
So um, during the process of this year, we've collected uh, nearly 50 different masks, which we purchased or had donated. Um, our focus has been on commercially available masks produced by the fashion industry rather than homemade masks, though we have also acquired a small number of functional and utilitarian masks. Um, we've also consciously acquired masks aimed at men or that are presented as unisex. Um, so yeah, just a reminder of the questions we were looking at in terms of gendering and how they've evolved. Um, and then I'll talk about the overarching themes. So um, we've grouped the masks that we're highlighting today around functionality, protection and status um, and largely chronological through that. Um, so functionality, these masks have been marketed with an emphasis on their functionality with frequent appeals to particular constru constructions of masculinity seen in menswear. Um, so this is the sort of ubiquitous non-woven non disposable mask that we see everywhere and they are all over the streets of London littering um, at the moment. Um, this particular one was sent to us as a free gift with a purchase we made from the Japanese online proxy buying service Zen Market. Um, Adidas, so this uh, pack of three masks was the first mask we purchased as part of this project. Um, and it's one of the first masks um, that was sort of commercially available, um, made by the fashion industry on a large scale. Uh, they were retailed, as I said, as a pack of three and presented as a sporting accessory. They quickly sold out. And as um, Andrew mentioned, we also look at the sort of grey market, the resale market, and at the moment they're being resold um, on sites like Railed. Um, we focused, we focused up as well on the kind of traditional British um, menswear brands, um, so sort of Savile Row, German Street, um, and this is from Charles Truitt, um, and it highlights many of the dilemmas designers and wearers have been confronted with as masks became mandatory in the UK, um, and this was from the 15th of June on public transport and the 24th of July for shops. How could they be integrated into everyday wear as a fashionable accessory? Um, and this company's designers um, have solved this by utilising the established language of menswear with the pocket square. So it's a mask that can also function as a pocket square. Uh, New and Lingwood are a uh, German street shirt maker. Um, and this mask draws on their history, um, that history as a gentleman's outfitter. The cloth is the tightly woven high thread count silk used to make um, silk neckties. It might be from British company Banners, um, who unfortunately have just gone into administration, which is really sad. They make, um, they've been making silk in Suffolk for a very long time. Um, and the piratical skull and crossbones motif is one that the company uses on many of its other um, accessories, such as ties, socks and slippers. Um, this motif's specific origins relate to the company's connections with Eton, but in the, this context, it's hard not to see it as a memento mori as well. And this Breed um, Easy lip reading mask. Um, so several companies began making face coverings with clear panels so that they could be worn to facilitate lip reading. Uh, the common assumption is made that they will be worn by those who are hearing impaired. However, the opposite is actually the case. Those who are hearing impaired need everyone to wear this type of mask, but they have, you know, been, they haven't been taken up in a, in a wide, you know, a large scale, and um, apparently they also have um, issues in terms of the clear panel misting up, which people who, anyone who wears glasses and has to wear a mask is familiar with that problem. And, and then the next section is on protection. So the first example we've got here is from the British Fashion Council, uh, British, British Fashion Council, Great British Designers Face Coverings. And this one in particular is by Christopher Raven. And uh, this was the first coordinated response from the British fashion industry and was a mixture of menswear and womenswear designers, including Halpern, Junior McDonald, Liam Hodges, Mulvey, Raven, and Ripso. And I suppose this is quite interesting because you know it's also about the protection of the industry. So these were commercially available in Chemist's Boots in the UK. 
and they were aimed to raise money for both the NHS in the UK, but also for the designer, BFC Designer Fashion Fund. And they resulted in them raising £500,000 through that. And I think it's become so successful, they've launched a second range. The next example is Hen Henry Lloyd, and this is from their website. And, and this for us is an example of masks being presented in an online retail environment. In this case, Henry Lloyd, with gendered imagery, here the man's almost militaristic appearance, seems both anonymous and aggressive in comparison and how the woman's being presented, styled in the language of sportswear or fitness. Uh, and another interesting point during our research is how often these objects weren't available online or they were hidden, they were invisible. So they weren't actually um, being foregrounded by the company systems you might want to buy. This next example, this is a reissue of the earlier jacket I showed you from CP Company. So this is an updated version with also an updated face mask pictured. And this has actually been in development in uh, 2019, so it predates the pandemic, but actually was then launched in store in August 2020, making it somewhat prescient of the current situation. And the early example I showed you sold for £600. This retailed for £2,175. This example uh, is an example of a specialised design master electricians working on building site. It has an antiviral treatment and conforms to numerous safety standards. And the FR stands for flame resistance. And this final section is on status. So here you can see um, um, one of the best examples of face masks that was appropriated the design and presentation of a standard medical mask but given its status through the use of cotton oxford cloth and the Ralph Lauren Pogo, polo logo. So the use of the fabric allowed the wearer to coordinate it with a shirt or a polo shirt. And this retailed for £19, but we bought it from eBay for £35, so it's already become part of the grey market. And one of the first masks produced by Savile Row Tailors in June 2020 is this example I'm going to show you from Huntsman. It's also notable for being one of the first high-end examples of a COVID-19 mask. It's coordinating approach to packaging and presentation, signifying its status. So it came in this piece of tissue paper that unwrapped to show this mask. And hopefully you can see how it also perhaps recalls that electrician's mask I showed you earlier with the initial in the corner. This example, Burberry were one of the first companies to make and donate PPE to the NHS back in May 2020, but only announced that they were to produce a commercial mask in late August, and these didn't appear until the end of October. This particular example came immaculately gift wrapped with its own Burberry check bag, an extensive 100 page booklet examining, explaining how to wear the mask properly. And this mask retailed for £9.90. At the same time, this example is from an online seller that had been purchasing original Burberry mask and using the linings to make new COVID-19 masks. As seen here, they prompted, they promoted them with an image of theirs being worn next to the current Burberry version. In this case, the mask plays on the ideas of status due to authenticity, heritage and transgression. And this example for December 2020 is from Balenciaga and is shown here presented with a Perspex case, which was in the Harvey Nichols. Oh, sorry, that's my alarm. Uh, in Harvey Nichols. So here, the visual language both suggests the object is an expensive status object, but also perhaps as a harmful tainted object and therefore needs to be contained. And then the final two examples. So the Burberry mask I just showed you sold out over two days and then Burberry relaunched the Burberry mask um, but in seven new colorways and here they've used the language of fashion marketing so the new seven Burberry masks are available in black, birch brown, alabaster pink, pale blue, soft fawn, antique yellow, pale blue check and again these are 90 pounds and then our last mask in the collection is this Louis Vuitton mask so, I don't know, Danielle, do you want to tell us about this mask? Yeah, so we were 
kind of looking for the most extreme sort of fashion response. Um, and there were a few different ones um, during the year that we discovered, um, including a Louis Vuitton visor, a uh, sort of clear visor, but I don't, we don't know if that actually ever went on sale. And then we found the um, Vuitton. Um, and as Andrew said earlier, it was sometimes quite difficult to actually locate masks on people's websites or um, even in store. Um, and yeah, so this is a, a example. It was available online, but it sold out. And then um, when I went into Vuitton at um, Selfridges to purchase it, um, they said it was a special order. So it was only available. You kind of had to know it was there to be able to get hold of it. Um, and it came in, it, so it's the cloth mask, very, very thin cotton foil um, with a matching thin cotton foil um, bandana. Um, and then various bags and packaging for it all to go into. And and this is an ongoing project, so I was going to say this project ends for us in March. So at the moment, I guess we're still collecting, so there's still a response. Um, and then after March, I guess we're at the time of reflection and actually look back at the last year and what this actually means. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to uh, both teams. Um, Miriam and Alison, Andrew and Danielle. Um, there's been a, a rich discussion going on in chat. You might wanna catch up on, please. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. Um, and I certainly ha have a couple, but I will wait to see uh, if any hands go up. Um, Caroline, would you like to ask a question? Yes, I would. Um, I. During my research, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the Anti-Mask League that was started in San Francisco in 1918 was chiefly, in fact, maybe entirely composed of women. So I was wondering if you, in your research, had come across a different, like a change in the attitude as far as masks um, over that period, as far as gender. Oh, unmute, Miriam, sorry. Um, yes, sorry. Um, um, so Yes, I did come across that information about the Anti-Mask League and it sort of the modern day commentary I've seen about it is that um, suffragettes at the time or people advocating for the vote didn't want to be silenced in, especially in the public sphere, they wanted to have a visible profile. So like to have a mask was sort of a silencing of their voice as political actors. So that's why they refused um, to wear the mask. And we actually wanted to include a cartoon, we didn't have time to talk about it, about sort of mask compliance. I think it was in Arizona in 1918. And it had sort of three um, cartoon figures. And the first one was a, um, do you remember the language, Alison? It was like a strongly opinionated female or something. And she looked like the typical sort of stereotype of like the masculine looking suffragette. Um, so there was definitely a commentary around sort of that's the kind of woman who wouldn't wear her mask. Um, and then, yeah, there were other sort of characters in that triptych. Yeah, framed as masculine for sure and depicted as masculine. Yeah. I mean, I, I know some of them also were um, people who had advocated for family planning. I mean, not family planning, like, <laughs> I mean, for family control of education, that kind of thing, as opposed to governmental overreach, um, which seemed like a, a divide of like a feminine sphere related to the mask as well. Mm -hmm. Beyond the mask, I think that I've seen that cartoon too, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, There's that exactly. masculine vibe. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I, I've got one then for uh, Andrew and Danielle. Um, there was an interesting discussion going on in chat about the difference between the pre-COVID masks and face coverings and the post-COVID uh, for, so that, that idea of the active wear uh, versus the protection, the face covering that protects. Um, for medical reasons versus protecting maybe for active, you're active and maybe a dangerous environment. I wondered if, if you could talk a little bit more about that. In particular, I was quite interested in the colors and in the materials that were used for the pre versus post masking, the patterns. Um, 
Sorry, I've muted. I'd say it's interesting. Funnily enough, the one I think is quite interesting is that flame retardant one I showed you with the FR on, because that was actually um, recommended to me by a friend who's an electrician, who said, oh, this is the really cool one the electricians wear. Right. So what perhaps us as outsiders to that world would think, well, surely they're all the same. You suddenly realise, no, there's a status to be had, even with things that look like, you know, they're just an ordinary mask. And I think when we began this project, we almost didn't begin it because we thought, well, masks, are they going to be quite boring? Are they all going to be the same? Will there be enough of differential and the genderfication of them for them to look in meaningful? And of course, that's been proved completely with the examples. Um, I think probably more important is, is whether there's been legislation in terms of people having to wear the masks or not, mm -hmm. and whether they feel that then they're being forced to wear them or it's a decision they're making. Um, but there's also interesting that CP company one I showed you, people are preferring to wear the earlier version than to the later version, because that seemed to be the original, the cooler version. So I think there's all sorts of dynamics that are going on around something that we might just see as an ordinary mask that someone's wearing. Um, but isn't at all to those decision making processes. Really interesting. D Danielle, did, did you want to say anything or should we go oh, to the yeah, other question? Well, just, yeah, just that, um, say, for example, with next generation. Um, so they did, they did include um, sort of pockets and, and, and elements of their jackets to um, have the very protective cycling masks, a very, a, it was a, re, a particular style and make, um, but a lot of their garments also had uh, integrated um, collars, which would then completely cover the face. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't necessarily about the sort of act of, you know, being, uh, that was more to do with the political elements, but also a design decision as well. So it's a combination of things. Really interesting. Monica, you have a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, my video isn't working, so I'll leave that off if that's okay. Um, of course. Thank you for some really interesting talks. Um, I'm doing some research on masculinity and kind of the relationship with masks um, in a piece that I'm doing for university. And I was wondering if you um, could kind of talk about um, looking at sport in particular and Formula One in particular. Um, when sports stars or you know heroes of people are wearing masks, do you think this is having a positive impact on um, kind of men that do find it possibly like negative to their masculinity, or do you think they're being pushed into a kind of like weaker spectrum? I say that in quotations. Do you think it's a positive or a negative? Who who did you want to ask that to, Monica? To anyone, uh, anyone any from the yeah, whoever wants to. What I'd say from our point of view, I thought it was interesting that when we started collecting, if you remember in the UK, masks weren't available, so you couldn't buy them, therefore we weren't meant to wear them. So I think it was very interesting, the first one was Adidas, and it had that connotation of sports and healthy and masculine. Mm -hmm. It used all of that language, so that the wearer wouldn't feel threatened wearing it. It, wasn't, it, it was um, actually a healthy object to be wearing. And I think that probably recalls also all our research of because predominantly we've been buying stuff online, all of us, I mean, um, where these objects end up, because websites with garments are gendered, menswear, women's wear, and where would they sit? And some of the masks sat in none of those categories. Some sat in menswear and women's wear, even though they're the same, and some were just women's and men's wear. So to look at them, you wouldn't know why. So who was making that decision making, and for what reason, I think that, that we'd like to do further research on um, because you know ultimately the masks are pretty similar in terms of their design and their functionality so that that role of marketing and how they're consumed I think is probably the next step and just in terms of color I was thinking seeing when you're speaking about the Adidas mask that it's black I don't know if it was marketed in other colors but again that's you know obviously we've talked about like the particular associations not mm -hmm. with hygiene or health but with kind of criminality more <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I'd add into that, I think what's also interesting, this is a new object category for fashion designers, fashion houses. Mm -hmm. They didn't know, it was interesting hearing that talk earlier about the flu pandemic, they didn't know how to respond to this. Do they do, they do masks? Do they not? Are they seen? It was interesting to see that earlier speaker talk about the Boohoo masks retailing for £5 and people being outraged. We were 
kind of worried about spending 40 pounds on a mask we thought that was horrific and you think within four months of that we're spending 350 <laughs> and as the salesperson said to danielle next season we've got a mask for how much was it Oh, you're muted, Danielle. You're muted, Danielle. What? Um, it was more, I can't remember. Was it 500, sort of 500 or something next season? And again, he, he said, you know, you have to register your interest. We'll send you out the information to say that it will be available on that special order. And it was <laughs> really precious. Are we okay to go to um, another question? Kat. Kat yeah, Young Nickel. I have a, a question for Alison and Miriam. Um, I was just, I love that list of the crepe criminal masks. And um, I, oh, you can see me. the crepe crim, criminal masks, I thought they were just fantastic. I wondered where that list of what made a great criminal mask came from. I just came up with it, actually. <laughs> yeah, I just was, because, you know, I just kept, like, I, I was thinking about it. I mean, I've been thinking about masking for a while, but, you know, it, it's interesting. I was also thinking, like, there's been so much about the functionality of COVID masks as well. So it made me think about the criminal mask as a kind of an actant and a, an actor and a functional piece as well, as, you know, so, but that said, I mean, like medical masks, um, where we show men, you know, not wearing them correctly often, and that's what I often see, say, on the subway, um, you know, the criminal mask was always functional. It didn't always work um, well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there's more to explore. Thanks, Kat. No, but I just came up with it. So. Well, I was hoping you were going to say that because my second part of that was, have you tried to then make some to see whether or not those oh, are going to hold? I think it's time. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Feel a project yeah. coming on. <laughs> I know. I do. I do write it. So I'll have to try embodying the highway person. <laughs> yeah. And that's one really insightful part of the court transcripts is that there's often very detailed information of how the mask would hang on the face and what was used to weigh it down and it as Allison mentioned like how it would malfunction sometimes and the techniques that were used to sort of prevent that um, which wasn't always possible. Yeah and some of them as Miriam was saying mentioned like lead weights to weigh them down for example sewn into hems which I've seen in fashion um, garments mm. as well. So yeah I think it's really that would be a really interesting approach. Thanks Kat. Thank you. Um, Sophie Wood would you like to ask your question? Hi. Hello. Um, so yeah, my question was about um, freedom and kind of sartorial freedom and masking in relation to gender. I was just wondering if anyone could speak a little bit more on that because to my mind, women are kind of more used to having their bodies policed, being told like by society what they can and can't wear and men perhaps are not so. So I thought maybe that had something to do with mask refusal and wanted to get the panel's opinion and also to show everyone my matching faux Burberry mask headband and um scrunchie that I got for Christmas because <laughs> when I saw it on screen I was like oh I've got one of those it's just not real Burberry brilliant did some did the panel want to take that on that question Miriam, do you want to talk? We were thinking about it in uniforms, as you mentioned, but like the parameters. Yeah. yeah, I think it was very telling that one of the studies um, I came across said that men didn't like masks because they infringed on their freedom, whereas women found them uncomfortable. So I think that's a really important distinction because masks are not comfortable for anyone, really. Um, and it also comes back to the question of when you see a man wearing, you know, a bandana or a gaiter, like that's not more comfortable than a mask. Yet some men, like I remember seeing men like in the summer in warm weather wearing like fleece gaiters. It's like, there's no way, like that's physically uncomfortable, but maybe like it signals something else. Like as we mentioned, it's part of a different uniform. So it's not so much a change in behavior or, you know, a change in the freedom to dress yourself because it's a regular accessory that you would be wearing and it's not a distinct mask. Great, thank you. Liberty Walker? You had a question. Hi, yeah, Hello. really great presentations. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering, uh, Andrew, um, when you were talking about 
the mask in the next that you're planning on buying sort of in the next sort of collection that's really expensive um what's your opinion on these brands sort of luxury targeting or like overpricing what would be essentially a kind of a form of protective equipment in a way yeah thank you well i don't think we will will be buying it because we spent what little money we had on that that louis vuitton um but I suppose it's quite interesting to say within the last nine months, we've gone from companies being chastised for selling masks for five pounds to retailing them for 350 and nobody noticing. And I think certainly in the UK, we've seen what, what happens in any situation like this and that happens in wars, people profit off everyone else's misery in a way, don't they? So I think the market naturally finds its price for those objects and their value. Um, and so, what we probably found quite hard was trying to make sure we could buy objects that we knew would sell out immediately and predominantly are not allowed to be resold. So none of those masks are able to be resold on eBay or ground because those sites have got restrictions on selling used masks. So I think that's, that's quite interesting how those designer masks, will they be resold in those environments like other objects or will they be forever tainted even though they haven't been used? So interesting. Um, we probably have time for a, a couple more questions. Uh, I'm just going to jump in with a, I think with probably a pretty quick one for Alison and Miriam. I'm interested in um, the rise in the, the mask worn for criminal purposes, as well as at the same time as the development of photography uh, by police forces and wondering if there's um, a connection there that you've made. It's a good question. I mean, there's certainly lots of mask wearing pre-photography, like with the highway robberies and things like that. I, I mean, photography obviously aims to, I mean, there's a lot of images. I'll have to think about that some more. I mean, the, the image I was showing you of the crepe by Henry Fox Talbot, I think is interesting yeah. in that because one of the first photographers yeah. was doing, like I, I was familiar with his, um, with his lace photography, sort of this idea of positive and negative, but I think his, uh, photo engraving shows that you can print these things um, as well and reproduce them and you can see the transparency and the weave through with this image so um, but I you know I'll have to think about that some more I I mean obviously the standardization of the mugshot with Bertillon and is coming I mean there are mugshots from when photography is invented um, of course but um, in so there are mugshot daguerreotypes for example um, but very, like, I mean, obviously most of the aim there is to show the face rather than to, you know, it's, it's just this transparency of the face. So I'll have to think about how those two. Yeah. Are okay. Great. Thank you. For surveillance. Yeah. 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 Outdoors or as a <laughs> technology isn't there. There's a lot of, I really encourage everyone to take some time to look at the chat. I think there's some really interesting comments there and a great discussion taking place. So, um, 